uh, fun week. We finally fixed the projector. It's not flickering anymore. Um, that's a great uh, work from uh, yeah, TLT. Um, I want to bring back um, something I did during uh, COVID with everyone being on Zoom, etc. We had the life hack series where, um, you know, there's a, there are like these little things that we do um, that make our lives so much easier. Um, life hacks, right? And we had every lecture, um, uh, one student would participate in sharing one of their life hacks. Um, and we had those typed up. We had a bunch of them. Um, and I want to start that this year again. So I'll, I'll give you an example of some life hacks from, um, from a couple of years ago. Um, from Porter Nelson, um, clean up spilled oil on the driveway with kitty litter. And then I suggested you can also use baking soda and talcum powder because we dealt with that with kids. So on carpets and, you know, oh, you know there's a spill, immediately clean it. Emily um, has a, had a tip for midterms. Um, uh, apparently what you wear affects your testing ability. So everyone was wearing red at every midterm. Um, that was her suggestion from psychology or something. Um, one of my tips was, um, you know, if you're setting a time with someone, set an awkward time to meet with them, they're more likely to remember it or write it down because it's like weird. Like say, hey, let's meet at 10.13 uh, a.m. Like 10.13, they're gonna say it again, they're more likely to remember because it's an awkward time. Um, you know, and, and other things. Um, I'll share a, another tip today. But for that, I'm gonna need a scribe, someone who... <laughs> um, okay, we'll have a scribe, we'll have... <laughs> you already have life hacks on. No, no, no. Oh no, we're gonna share them in a Google folder, in a Google file, so that um, in a Google Doc, so that everyone has them by the end of the semester. I suppose there's no objections to Miles being our scribe. So officially, I anoint you as the scribe of the life hack series for 2023, sir. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And I will need a volunteer for each lecture. So at the end of the lecture. We'll share, we'll take like two minutes. Um, hopefully we're not running out of time. We'll take two minutes. You share your um, life hack and we have a volunteer for the week after. Um, so let's do it. Um, we'll do it right now. Um, I'll share my, I'll start by sharing a tip with you. So uh, during COVID, I bought a lot of ice cream because we, we were like, you know, we had the kids with us and we're like, okay, best thing, bribe them with ice cream. So I bought like, 15 cans of the, like the deluxe churned ice cream, all you know, the big cans, put them in the chest freezer and a month later I go up and start opening them and they're all dried up and hard as stone. You've had that happen, like an old uh, can of ice cream in the, in the freezer and like what the heck is going on? And apparently they were all, they all kind of dried up. Um, and uh, so the trick there is to put them in a Ziploc bag to seal the moisture. So get one of those large um, quart size Ziploc bags or any other bag, kind of seal them in. They would last at least four or five months. They'll stay fresh and soft like the day you buy them. So that's my tip of the, of the day for your ice cream indulgence. Um, volunteer for next week. All right, we got a volunteer for next week. So Miles. I'm going to start scribing, start a, start a Google Doc and share it with me and uh, we'll get started. Okay. Okay, so for linear solvers, we're done with them. I, I did a special lecture yesterday. I recorded it and put it on YouTube um, to finally do the tridiagonal solver on the heat transfer problem. Please watch that lecture because it truly really shows you the immense cost you would be paying by using direct solvers on, uh, by using Gaussian elimination and standard solvers on large systems of equations. Um, and that is gonna be an issue because you are gonna be dealing with large systems of equations. I guarantee you that when you're, when you're out of this program, dealing with data science um, jobs, you're gonna be dealing with a lot of equations. So don't use direct solvers. Anyway, that lecture sh shows you the immense cost savings also from the TDMA method. Um, shows some tricks to measure memory and things like that. It's on YouTube. Yes, Ethan. It is a direct solver. It's a special direct solver. We did not do any iterative solvers, okay? 
Now, at the end of the, those slides, the PDF, so go get the latest PDF from the front page, there's about 100, 100 more slides talking about other kinds of solvers in Python, how to do sparse matrix storage, and things like that. I'm going to follow up with an announcement to have a, um, a bonus set of material and bonus set of problems for those who want to kind of take on an extra challenge. But the slides are available for everyone. The extra slides, you, can, you might not use them now, but in, in a few years, you might find them useful. Feel free to just take a copy of those. Um, we talk about sparse systems, um, iterative solvers in Python, fast solvers, conjugate methods, all of that, all the programming tips and techniques, how to do that. So it could be a nice repository for you. Okay. Today we are, so we are still now in part two of the course, solving algebraic equations. And so far we solved linear equations. We know how to solve a single linear equation. We learned how to solve a system of linear equations. In this chapter, we are going to start solving nonlinear algebraic equations, both single and systems of nonlinear equations. Again, I apologize for, for those of you on this side who can't see all of this, but you can follow on the PDF slides on, um, on your laptops if you want. Um, the learning objectives for this chapter are as follows. By the end, I'm hoping you'll be able to define what a nonlinear equation is, what's meant by solving the equation f of x equals 0, define and write down what's called the residual form of a nonlinear equation, um, define what is meant by the root of an equation or a zero of an equation, define what we mean by closed and open domain methods for solving nonlinear systems, create Python code that calculates the roots for nonlinear equations using built-in tools, and then um, we're going to learn what's inside the built-in tool. Yes, the built-in tool is useful. We can use it. But you also, as an engineer, you are held to a slightly higher standard than a technician. You need to know what goes behind the scene so that maybe in the future you create a new, um, a new solution routine, for example. Um, create Python code that does the implements Newton's method and learn Newton's method, um, how F-solve essentially works. Identify a system of nonlinear equations, calculate the roots of systems of nonlinear equations, and interpret those geometrically. Um, these two in red are not required this year, and I'm not going to cover them, but they're going to be in the additional material. Okay? So we're going to start with a problem. I don't have a sensational story for this chapter, but I tried to come up with one um, from a few textbooks the other day. Um, so imagine your city is building um, some, you know, replacing its piping network, and you've seen those large pipes. People can walk through them, and apparently during a construction phase, some, somehow 26,000 gallons of water, or about 98.5 cubic meters of water, leaked into one of the pipes under construction. Um, and the question is, find out if a maintenance person who's uh, five foot seven, um, that's about my height, you know, about 170 centimeters, can walk through the pipe to investigate the damage without being submerged in water. So we want to make sure, like, does the water level leach, reach their, you know, face, or is it kind of lower than their height, okay? So that's the question. All right, so how do we do that? I'm going to give you the equation for if you spill some volume of water, V, into a pipe, now remember, this pipe is not a rectangular channel, so it's not a simple volume calculation. It's actually circular, so you've got to take into account this entire volume. Um, so the volume, if you dump a certain volume V into a pipe, um, the relation between V and the length of the pipe, the radius of the pipe, and the maximum height of the water is given by that formula. Okay? So V is given to us as 98.4 cubic meters. L is given to us as the pipe length, 15 meters, and the radius is 4 meters, okay? Um, so we still have H as the unknown in this case. Okay, so how do we solve this problem? Clearly, if we can find for that volume of water, that length of pipe, and that radius, if H is less than the height of the person, then the person can walk without being submerged, right? So if we can find H, we can tell if a 5 foot 7 uh, person can walk in that pipe without being submerged. Okay? So now I'll ask you, can you solve this problem analytically? Like just looking at the, you're given V, you're given L, you're given R. 
Can you find H? Yeah, by hand. How? Can you do that math? No, 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 no. You got to do it analytically. Can you do it analytically? Yeah, yeah. Not, not F solve, not nonlinear. So can you do it? Okay, let's see what you can do. <laughs> Try. I mean, what would you do? You take the cosine of the equation or take the, like, what do you do? So, so V, L, and R are constants. They're fixed. You're trying to find H. So pull H out of this equation. Express H in terms of everything else. Can you? Express it in terms of V, L, and R. So, so okay, put the numbers. Put, you can put the numbers. And this is in meters cubed. So, yeah, 98.4. Uh -huh. 15. Yeah. So what are we thinking? Put your name tags, please. I, I'm almost there remembering all your names. TAs, what do you think? What do you think, Andrew? It's impossible. OK, so. So can you get H? You can't find an analytical solution for it. Yeah. OK. Hmm? I was wrong. I love when I hear that. <laughs> OK, so there is no solution for this. There is no analytical solution for this. It is not easy to extract h out of this equation, right? Because there's an arc cosine, or the inverse cosine. h is under that. And then you have a square root over there with h and h squared. It's a very complex equation. There's no way on Earth you can analytically solve for h from this equation. You can keep trying at home. You're welcome. Um, but there's no way to do it. It is impossible, OK? It's, there's no easy way to do it. And this is unsolvable by simple algebraic ma manipulation. This is because H appears in a nonlinear fashion in the governing equation. So this problem is to motivate you that some equations are very complex, and they ha we call them nonlinear, and they're so hard to deal with. So, so far, we know how to solve systems of equations, linear, linear equations. In this chapter, you will learn to solve equations that look like this. Log x plus cosine x e to the minus 0.1 x equals 0, or the one that we just saw. And also systems of nonlinear equations like this. And we're at the end of the chapter, we're going to solve a system of like 1,000 nonlinear equations together. That same heat transfer problem, we're going to make it nonlinear. Okay? But what is a nonlinear equation or function? Give you a definition. It's my definition. A nonlinear equation is one where the variable of interest appears nonlinearly. In other words, the variable of interest appears under a power or a transcendental function. You immediately can say that that variable appears nonlinearly. Non -linearly. So take this equation, for example. You have the following parameters. A, R, Q, and H. Some parameters, OK? Now my question to you is, in this equation, how do A, R, H, and Q appear, linearly or nonlinearly? So in other words, if you're looking at A, if you were to fix all other values, R, H, and Q, if you had like constants for those, numbers for those, how does A show up? Does it show up linearly or nonlinearly? Next. Okay. 
Why? Because you have an a squared and a square root of a, right? Okay. Next, r. Fix everything else, but let's look at r. r does appear linearly. It's not under a power or a transcendental function, correct? Okay, what about h? Well, you have a cosine h that's immediately nonlinear because cosine is a transcendental function. Okay? What about q? It appears linearly, right? There's just q. So in other words, you can solve for the linear variable immediately. Now, this is still called a nonlinear equation, right? But for our interest, what we're going to be dealing with, we're going to have equations that have multiple variables. In the equation before that we looked at, the volume and the length of the pipe, they appear linearly. So we can solve for those directly given everything else. But H and R appear nonlinearly in that other equation. So what matters is going to be context. If you're given an equation, it might look ominous and generally nonlinear, but really what matters is whether your variable of interest, the variable that you're trying to solve for, shows up in a nonlinear fashion or not. Okay? So this is the answer here, just like we did. Okay. Now next, what do we mean when we say we want to solve f of x equal to 0? I'm going to give a geometric interpretation. This is some concocted function, f of x, plotted on an xy plane. And this is the line y equals 0. Now, the intersection of f of x with the line y equals 0, those points are called the roots of that equation. And when we say solving f of x equals 0 means finding those values of x where that function intersects the x-axis, okay? Those are called the roots of the equation or also the zeros of that equation. So going back to our water pipe problem, h is going to be the root for that equation if we are able to solve that equation with the given numbers. h is going to be a root. Okay. So next, take this function and visually locate the root on the blue curve. Just point to it. There. <laughs> it's here? Here? No, it's the intersection with the black line, right? Yeah. So that's the root, right? That's the root. Okay, good. Good, that wasn't uh, very hard. Okay. Here's another equation. This curve is given by some function f of x, whatever it is, but it looks like this. Now visually locate the root f of x equal 10. Okay, so it's the intersection between the blue curve. Take a moment to think about it. Where is the root of f of x equal 10? f of x is the blue curve. Uh, so yeah, 6.23, six, uh, 6 yeah, okay. So the intersection of f of x with the line y equal 10, so previously f of x equals 0, we intersected it with the line y equals 0. Right? f of x equal 10, you're intersecting it with the line equal 10. And that is going to give you the root. Okay? 6.75, actually. Okay. So the root of f of x equal alpha is the point of intersection of y equal f of x and the horizontal line y equal alpha. There's a reason behind this madness why I'm doing this. Now I'm going to take this same curve, okay? I'm going to move it down here. That's f of x equal 10. It's the same curve on the upper left, but now I need to find a new function called r of x, and that r of x is defined as f of x minus 10. So it's that same function down there, except I moved 10 to the left-hand side. Now, where do you think the root is of this f of x equal, minus 10 equals 0? 6.75, exactly. The root didn't change. We just moved the function. Okay, but the root didn't change. Why are we doing this? Because we need to standardize the way we talk about nonlinear equations. This method of putting everything on the left-hand side is called the residual form of nonlinear equations. There you go. Now you can define what a residual form is. And here's a definition. The root of f of x equal alpha is the same as the root of r of x equal f of x minus alpha equals 0. Okay? 
and R is called the residual function. So all you have to do is move everything to the left-hand side, or everything to the right-hand side, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. OK, so now write log x plus cosine x squared equal 3 in residual form. What is the residual function for this? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Piece of cake. OK, good. OK, so r of x, in this case, simply move everything to the left-hand side, is log x plus cosine x squared minus 3 equals 0. The root of r of x equals 0, in other words, the value of x that makes this guy equal 0, is the same value that makes log x plus cosine x squared equal 3. OK, it's the same value. Why do we standardize it this way? Because it provides a universal way to communicate about nonlinear equations and how we solve them. You always supply the residual form to a nonlinear solver. All right, so now let's go back to our problem with the pipe, the water being filled in the pipe. Write the residual form for this one. Go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just write it. Entertain me. I know this is simple, easy. Okay. Yeah. Yep, yep. <laughs> move everything to the left. You got it, okay. So people are saying move everything to the left hand side and call that R of something, okay? Okay. Indeed, that's the residual form V minus all of that mass, LR squared, etc., etc. Now I want to emphasize something because despite how easy this looks and is, it always gets people in the exam because of what they need to put in the argument over here. Okay? So in this problem, I have fixed V, L, and R. And so I'm particularly looking for the root H. So this equation is nonlinear in H. And solving this equal to 0 means finding the root h that makes this whole thing equal to 0. But I emphasize in the residual r, in the argument for the residual function r of h. Yes, v, l, and r are parameters, but those are given to us, those are fixed. Really, the variable for which I'm trying to find the root is h. So I emphasize r of h, okay, to clarify that this residual is for the nonlinear variable h. Yes, Miles. You can move v to the other side. Because 0, yeah, it's equal to 0. It doesn't matter. So Miles is saying, could you, we moved everything to the left-hand side. Is it, is it equal to move everything to the right-hand side? Yes. OK, and we'll give you the same answer. So v minus l, et cetera, equal to 0 is equivalent to l times et cetera minus v equal to 0. OK, whichever one you choose. Yes. Uh, oh, sorry. This is a. This is not the radius. My bad. So uh, nomenclature issue. This is residual function. This is a residual function. That's a great catch. Thank you for catching that. Okay, so let's call it um, residual. Okay. Oops. Too many animations. OK. Is this better? Yeah. Residual of h. Yeah. Good, uh, good catch. Thank you. OK. It's important to have clear nomenclature. OK. So like we've always done, we're first going to learn how to drive and then understand how the car works. OK. So we're going to be, the reason I do this is because it's good to have a win, right? It's, we want to win. We've learned this now. Let's have a win, and then we can dig deeper and suffer a little bit through the math. OK. So root finding in Python. Python because it's awesome, uh, also provides some tools for uh, solving nonlinear equations, single equations or systems of equations. Okay? 
And this is obtained through the scipy.optimize package. Okay? It offers a bunch of nonlinear solvers. The one we're going to use, the one that you're going to need for most of your life, okay, is fsolve. And the way you import it is from scipy.optimize, import fsolve. Okay? Now, what is the function signature of fsolve? We're going to start with the least amount of information to get working with fsolve. Fsolve takes two arguments that are non-optional. Everything else is optional. You see the three dots here. Those two arguments are called in the, in the fsolve um, definition. They're called func and x0. Func is simply the name of a Python routine that implements your residual function. Okay? So you have a nonlinear equation you want to solve. Cosine x equal log x squared. First order of business, you write your residual function, residual of x in this case. You write it down. You go program it in Python as its own routine. Def my residual function. We'll do this in a minute. Okay? And you write it down. Okay? You write it down, the residual function. Now, be very careful that this routine, the first argument in this routine, must designate the variable that you're trying to solve for. So that's why I called it residual of h. To clarify that, that h is the unknown that I'm trying to find, the root, OK? So this is just simply the name of a Python routine. So now we need to be able to program a residual function. And x0 is an initial guess. We will understand why we need an initial guess for these methodologies. This is going to be your first iterative method that you're going to learn. But for now, trust that we just need an initial guess. How do you get the initial guess? Beats me. I don't know. However, however, in practice, you are going to be the expert on the system you're dealing with. Say you're solving. Or you've, you've dealt with pipes your entire life, okay? And you know that roughly, you know, if I spill 26,000 gallons of water, we've had heights of about, you know, um, 1.2 meters. Put 1.2 meters and let's see what happens, okay? Another way is to actually visualize your residual function. Plot it and see where it intersects with the x-axis. And then say, okay, there's a route around... 1.5. Let's put that as our initial guess. Okay? There are pros and cons to that method, and it's not always possible to do that. However, um, let's go ahead and do this in Python together. So go ahead and pull up um, uh, your Jupyter Notebooks. Okay? And let's do this together. Okay? So this is our residual. We got V. 98.4, L is 15, and R equal 4 meters. So shouldn't take us more than a few lines of code to get this working. Oops. What happened? Uh-oh. They fixed both of them, huh? <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So I'm going to move the slides um, over there. Maybe we'll just kind of just do it together. Let's see. Okay. So I'm going to create a new notebook, and I'm going to have neck pain by the time. <laughs> This is over. OK. So uh, from scipy.optimize, import fsolve. So if you type fsolve now and shift tab, you're going to see a bunch of options. We're going to learn about many of those once we derive the method behind fsolve. But right now, all you need are the first two arguments. The residual function and x0. Okay? So let's go ahead now and implement our residual function. Um, let me see what it is. Move to crest on. Okay. 
OK. So residual function, it didn't move over there. Hold on. OK. So our residual function is v minus l r squared. OK. Let's see if we can put them side to side. OK. So what I'm going to do in Python, I'm going to define my residual function. I'm going to call it um, pipe residual. And for that function right now, I'm only going to pass the one argument h, OK? Because that's the variable we're looking for. Uh, call it h, OK? And then simply implement it. Return okay, v minus l times r squared um, over right. <laughs> OK, times r squared, OK, times r cosine. Where do I get arc cosine? I'm going to get it from NumPy. Import NumPy as NP. SciPy does have the arc cosine, but I, I don't know how to get to it. So times um, NumPy dot arc cosine. OK, now under arc cosine, we have R minus H. And there's going to be another parentheses here, R minus H over R. OK, so that's arc cosine minus r minus h times square root mp dot square root of 2 times, so 2.0, you can't see, <laughs> times r times h minus h squared. OK? And we're still missing one parenthesis. OK. So now you say, what is v, r, and, uh, and uh, what is v, l, and r? We, yes, Ethan. It's cheaper, yeah. It's cheaper to do. When you have an integer power, I, co I cannot rely on the programming language to do that as a non-exponential operation. OK, so I do it r times r or r times r times r. It, it doesn't matter much, but it's, a, it's an old habit, OK? Um, good question. OK, so now you might say, well, v and l and r, their parameters, why not pass them as arguments to the function? We'll do that later. Now let's just try to get the car moving, OK? So I'm going to hard code those numbers. I'm going to do v equal 98.4, which is cubic meters. L is equal to 15 meters. And R is equal to 4 meters, OK? OK, so it gave me a syntax error because I can't see a darn thing over here. V A minus L times R cosine. Does anyone see my mistake? Oh, this one here. OK. All right, so when in doubt, let's plot it out, OK? We're going to print it out or plot it out. Let's plot it. So let's create a lens space for H. Okay, we're going to go from 0 to like 6, let's say. OK, and then let's, um, let's plot it. Because I want to see where the root is, right? So now this residual function with v, l, and r fixed is only a function of h. So if we plot it versus h, the intersection of that function with the x-axis is going to be where the root is. Okay. So let's import matplotlib. Uh, All right, I don't go faster than plt.plot. So let's plot r of h, or my residual, or pipe residual of h. OK. Oh, look at that. OK. So plt.grid. OK. All right, so that's the residual function. On the x-axis, eight. let's um, scroll up a little bit. OK. On the x-axis is h. OK, starting from 0 to all the way to 6. And you see the residual function starts at 100, then passes through 0, and then goes negative, right? So our root is somewhere over here, 
like 1.5 maybe or something, okay? So that's where our root is. Good. There is a root in this function, okay? All right. Let's solve it. Let's find that root. Are we all in sync here? Yeah? We ready to do F solve? Let's do F solve. F solve. Okay, F solve. What do we, do? What do we put for the func function? We're going to put pipe, residual, just the name, the handle. It's called a handle, okay? Just the name of the residual function. And the second argument is going to be our initial guess. Let's maybe start at 1.0. Drum roll. Look at that. It returned a number. 1.5 meters. Okay, 1.5 meters. What is that number? That's the value of H that makes that residual function zero, which means that's the value of H, that's the height of the water, okay, when we dump this much volume, 98.4, and with a, and a pipe of length 12, 15 meters and radius 4 meters. Can you yeah. scroll up? All right. Um, where are you guys here? Okay. Yeah. So maybe I zoom out a little bit. Yeah. Sorry, it's kind of a long equation. Import NumPy. Okay, so one, those of you who got 1.5, do you agree that this, Connor? Oh, Connor, <laughs> you're, yeah, 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 okay. So. Once you're done with the residual function, tell me where you're at. Done with the residual function, okay. Okay, there's the residual function. Okay. Can I scroll down? Thomas, Brandon, can I scroll down? Okay. Okay. Did you get it? Yeah. No? Okay. What are you stuck? Not line space, lin space. Lin space, okay? So this 1.5, given this much water in this pipe, that's the height of the water. So can the 1.7 meter person, can I walk down in that pipe without being submerged? Yeah, because the water's gonna reach up here. I'll be like, oh, I'm walking like that, right? I can probably float in it, but yeah, I can go in, right? Yes. From what? So From putting one? Yeah, so it will, okay, let's try it. Let's try it. So you're suggesting we put an initial guess of two. Okay. Still the same. Yeah, so once we dig under the hood, we will learn that the closer you are to the root, the faster you're going to converge. However, the method that this algorithm uses, okay, if certain conditions are met for the function, and, you're, you're get, and those, conditions are, those conditions are met, then, your algorithm, then the algorithm is going to definitely converge, then it will converge pretty darn fast. So the difference is going to be one or two iterations. We'll be able to see that once we implement our own under the hood, see what's going on under the hood. Um, yeah, so this will not be able to find multiple roots, OK? This will only converge to one root at a time. If you had multiple roots, like for polynomials, you have to pick the, um, the guess that's closer to that root. There are other methods for polynomials, which we're not going to cover here, but this is, this is building up to something more complex. Yes? Um, if you put it at zero, it does. Yeah, it's not always guaranteed to work. Yeah, sometimes the residual function actually doesn't, like in, this, in some cases here, this is not going to exist. So, okay, so through an error, it's not converging, okay? So what do you do in this case? You pick another root. Okay, we'll see why it's not going to converge because there's a local maximum over here. This method will get stuck in local minima or maxima. There's, there's a lot more to talk about, okay? Yeah. Uh, pardon me? Here, that's the initial guess. That's the initial guess for your root. So we guessed that from this picture, 
we guess that the root is somewhere around 1.5, OK? So. And initial guess always needs an initial guess. Okay. You can play with nonlinear equations now. Solve log x equal cosine x squared. Okay. Write residual function, plot it, and see what happens. Okay. We're done. <laughs> That's it. Right. I wish. Okay. Okay. So now we can switch back to the slides, and we can say. Let's see. Ah. Okay. Now, like in this case, we had V, L, and R as parameters. So what if now you want to play around with those numbers and see what if our pipe were bi was bigger, what if we dumped more water. Let's say you're part of the city management and planning and you want to make sure that you, know, you have good sized pipes that they're not going to fill up, et cetera, et cetera. Right? You don't want to every time to go and put in numbers in V, L, and R. You kind of want to pass those as arguments to the function, okay? as additional arguments to the function. F-solve allows you to do that. okay? So if you were to define your residual function, the first argument always designates the variable you're trying to find the root for, in this case, h. But you can add as many other arguments as you want. In this case, I gave the example a, b, c. So those would be v, l, and r. Let's say you want to keep repeating this process in a loop. Go scan over all v's, all l's, all r's, and find a root. Okay? You pass those, you loop, and you pass those as arguments. Then f solve, remember f solve is going to take a residual function. The first argument is always the one referring to the, to, to the variable that designates the root, but you can also pass additional arguments to f solve through this mechanism here. Okay. You might not find this very useful right now, but once we get to harder problems, this will be useful. Notice the match here. The first argument is always by default being passed through internally with F solve. All other arguments you can pass them through F solve with these args. Okay? So let's see how this might work. As a programmer, you should avoid having global declarations like this. Okay? So I'm going to comment all of this, and now I'm going to design my pipe residual, give it V, L, and R. Okay. So now if I come and plot the residual here, yeah, it's not going to work, right? Because it's missing V, L, and R. But if I give it 98.4, for example, or like, you know, let's say 50, and then L is 12, and R is 3, Right? It's going to plot something with different conditions. And you can change those conditions immediately as part of the arguments. Now, how do you pass this through F solve? It's the same thing. Pipe residual, initial guess, and then I'm going to put args equal. You pass it as a tuple in parentheses. Our pipe residual function took V, L, and R in that order. So I'm going to pass 98.4. 15 and 4, and gives you that same root. Now, you can easily change those, right? You can do, let's say, what if we had 94 cubic meters, right? The root is going to change. What if the pipe was 12 meters long? The root is changing, OK? Yes? Not really related, but how do you do the, like, return them all in the comments? Oh, command forward slash. Um, or in your case, I think alt forward slash slash. It's like one of those uh, modifier buttons. Okay. Okay. Now this is useful when F solve is only one piece of a larger piece of code where you're computing one function, another function, another function. You're returning arguments. You pass them to F solve internally without having to hard code anything. So that's the power of these things, OK? OK, that's it. Now we know how to use F-solve. We're going to start digging deeper. I hope to cover um, Newton's method today. 
It's a nonlinear. So F solve is a nonlinear solver. Okay. That's a great exam question. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Miles. So. <laughs> Try it. It solves nonlinear equations, definitely. That's the definition of it. OK. OK, so now we're going to dig under the hood, see what's inside F solve, OK, and see all the beautiful math um, behind it. In general, OK, in general, if you care, nonlinear solvers are categorized into two categories, what we call closed domain methods and open domain methods. Closed domain methods, also known as bracketing methods, they say, I know there's a root around 1.5. So I'm going to create an interval around that root, let's say 1 and 2, and somehow keep refining that interval until I hit the root. How do you know you hit the root? f of x equals 0, right? Or less than a tolerance. So you say you take the interval. One of the methods is that you take the interval, you cut it in half, and then check if you are to the left or to the right of the root. And then keep cutting in half, keep adding, cutting in half until the midpoint of your interval is at the root. Okay, F of that midpoint is less than a tolerance. Okay, those are bracketing methods. They're very robust. What do we mean by robust? They work all the time. If you've bracketed a root, you are guaranteed to get a root to a root, right? You are guaranteed to get to the root. However, they are impractical because you need to have two data points. And when you are blind to what's going on, like when there are hundreds of equations, you can't even visualize them. You have no clue where the roots are. And what do you do? You do a hypercube in multiple dimensions. You can do that. Okay? So they have limited applicability. That's why we're not going to cover them or study them this year. Open domain methods, on the other hand, they're shooting in the dark. You just pick one guess and figure out a way to get to the root. They're not robust, but when they converge, they will converge fast, okay? like the method we just used built in in Python. And that's the method we're going to study. It's called um, the, uh, the newton raphson method. Okay? The other methods are covered in extra material um, in, this, in, the, in these slides. The idea of the newton raphson method, also known as Newton's method, is start with a guess for the root. That's the x0 in f solve and develop a recipe to improve that guess. In other words, say, where do I think the root is located? And let's move in that direction and keep refining, refining until you get to that root. All right? I'm going to share with you a little video from a film uh, called 21. Oh, is that the, the, the blackjack? Uh-huh. <laughs> the, the one where he gets the handcuffs. OK, so do you remember it? <laughs> Okay. It's like a very short clip. Okay. All right. Okay, so I, I like picking up um, bad math scenes in movies, but some of them have good math consult consults, so, um, you know. Okay. This is the guts, what you're going to see in the next two slides. Be very careful attention. We're going to go through it without interruption is the foundation of f solve the foundation of nonlinear solvers it's called the newton method or the newton raphson method you take a residual function and lo and behold the taylor series which we questioned its importance early on in the class right like what is the what is the taylor series for it's everywhere mr taylor okay his first name was brook okay so write the Taylor series around some point x0. We know how to do that. r of x is r of x0 plus x minus x0, r prime of x0, plus dot, dot, dot. OK. What is the magic trick we've used all the time? We're going to truncate this series to the first two terms only. Why? Well, why not? OK. Like, I don't want to deal with an infinite series. Why only take two terms? Because the first two terms are linear. In a linear equation, we can solve quickly, immediately. If I add one more term, I'm going to have an x squared. That's a quadratic. It's going to mess things up. I take the first two terms, OK? And then I'm going to approximate my residual function as r of x equal rx0 plus x minus x0 r prime. 
We committed an error here, a truncation error. We're going to put that under the rug for a minute and see what happens. Numerical methods. Now we ask ourselves again, we wish to solve, remember our objective is to solve r of x equals 0. In other words, find the value of x that makes r of x equal to 0. Now, can you make the connection between that statement and that approximation? So assume you know x0 in this a formula, r of x equal r of x0 plus x minus x0 r prime of x0. So you know r, you know x0. Can you solve for x? So that r of x equals 0. Solve for it and by hand, analytically. Find the value of x. So the statement here says, treating x0 as a guess for the root of r of x equals 0, use this two-term series to improve that guess. In other words, just set r of x equal to 0 and find x. And I'll tell you what we're going to do with that x in a minute. I agree, this is an approximation to the true r of x. But forget that for a moment. If this were your r of x, what is the root of that equation? So given this r, so this is an approximation to the true residual function. You agree? Okay. It's r of x. Suppose it's equal to r of x0 plus x minus x0, r prime of x0, whatever x0 is. Now I'm telling you, find the root for that equation. Equal to what in terms of x0? Find the root. So now you have an equation. You have x0, r of x0, and r prime of x0. Find x. Find the root. Find the root for this linear equation. So what did we get? That's, that's correct, but I want everyone else to derive that. <laughs> so guys, if you set R, if I give you AX plus B equals zero, what is X? Minus B over A, right? Just solve for X in this one. This is a linear equation, right? Because you, this is linear in X. Right? So you can solve it exactly. If you set r of x equal to 0, that will find the root for that equation, right? OK. Not clicking? I don't know why you guys complicate it so much. Just set r of x equal to 0 and solve for x. You know this value, you know this value, you know x0. This is a linear equation in x. Just solve for x. Find x. What is x? Write it. Write it down. You did already. OK. OK, so this gives you, if you were to do that, this gives you x equal x0 minus r of x over r, pri r of x0 over r prime of x0. OK. So now let's step back a minute. Let's step back a minute. Let's step back one step backward. This is not the root for the true R of X. Uh-uh. Okay, this is the root for the approximation of R of X. Agreed? This is the root for the two-term Taylor series approximation of R of X. Agreed? Yeah, it's what makes this equation here with the squiggly lines equal to zero, right? But we are after the root of the full function of r of x. What if we do the following? What this looks like, it looks like a recipe to me. I'm starting with a, some value. I know everything here. And I've improved over that value. What if I take that improved value and put it back in here and repeat? And keep repeating. Keep repeating. Am I going to converge? OK. So treat this new x value 
as an improved guess and call it x1. So now you have x1 equal x0 plus r of x0 over r prime of x0. Now treat x1 as the new guess and let's improve it again. You go to x2 equal x1 minus r of x1 over r prime of x1 and keep doing that, keep doing that however many times you want. However many times you want until you hit the root. We're not going to prove that this method converges to a root. The proof is a little bit more involved. But when certain conditions are met, it will converge to a root and will converge very fast. How did we do this? Well, yeah, you know, it's, new, it's numerical methods. It's not exact math. It turns out that many processes in numerical methods look like this. You come up with a recipe for one case, and you're like, hey, what if I repeat it? I keep improving in it, I keep improving in it. This process of improving is called iteration. You are iterating over the initial guess to keep improving it until you get to a point where that guess is on top of the root. The method will converge when certain conditions are met beyond the scope of, our, of what we want to cover here. But for most cases, it will converge. I saw a couple of cases where it doesn't converge. When you're dealing with these problems, if it doesn't converge, just start with another route. Okay? In practice, what happens? You know the system you're dealing with. Okay? And typically, these nonlinear solvers are used with what we call time-stepping methods. So you already have an initial condition. You take it one step. You use the new solution as your initial guess for the next step because you haven't departed that far away and you're always guaranteed to find a root, okay? Now, what does this look like geometrically? This is the best, I think, way to think about a Newton's method. I'm gonna give the statement here in words and then when we draw it, it's gonna make sense. For a given guess, xk, so k is a counter, okay? For a given guess, it could be x0, x1, x2, Newton's method finds the next guess, xk plus 1, by drawing a line at the slope of the residual function and intersecting that line with the x-axis. Okay, let's see how that happens. So suppose you have this function, and this is the root in red, okay? That's where this function intersects with the x-axis. Suppose this is your initial guess, okay? This is what Newton's method does. It finds r of x0, so your initial guess is x0. It finds r of x0. Then, remember in the formula, there's an r prime of x0, that r over r prime. That is the equation. That equation is the equation of a straight line that is tangent to r of x0. You see that line? We drew that tangent line right at r of x0. And when it intersects with the x-axis, it gives you the next approximation. So we start x0, went up to the function, drew a tangent line, intersected with the x-axis. That's our new guess. Repeat the process. Now we're at x1. Draw the vertical line out of x1. Draw a tangent. And that's going to be x2. And you see how... We are progressively getting closer and closer to the root. And you can continue and you'll convert. Once you hit the root, you stop. Okay? Yes? You check if f of x is equal to 0. Right? Right? Or less than a certain tolerance. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Whatever the function looks like, even if the function was on the other side, the slope is going to be negative. It's going to drive you directly to that minimum. It will always get you to that minimum or whatever the root is. Okay? Here's the algorithm. You are given an initial guess, a residual function, the derivative of the residual function, and a tolerance. Okay? That's where you want to stop. That's where you, want to, where you say, well, you know, that's good enough. F of x equal 10 to the minus 10. That's my root, okay? Start by calculating 
R of x0 and R prime of x0. Then calculate a new guess for the root. Call it x1 equal x0 minus R of x0 R prime. Very simple formula. Then check for convergence. That's the question. If R of x1, the new root, is less than your tolerance, then exit the loop. You're done. Okay. If you're not converged, then treat x1 as your new x0 and repeat. The whole thing is literally about seven, eight lines of code. We're going to do it in um, the next two slides. But first, when do you stop? A word about tolerance. If your function ranges between 0 and 0 0.1, your tolerance, tolerance probably should be very, very small, like 10 orders of magnitude smaller than 1, like maybe 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the minus 8. But if your function ranges between 1,000 and a million, then I can accept a tolerance of 100, okay? Because the function values are so large, right? It's about relative scale. So once I'm close enough to the root, I'm going to call it a victory. Okay, so let's Pythonify this together. But I'm going to ask you a question first. So again, as I think about writing a code, I think about two things. I think about the routine as a processor of some sorts. It takes an input and produces an output. What do we need to implement our Newton method? What inputs do we need? And what inputs, outputs should it provide? I want some participation from the back. Sorry, Abigail. Sorry. <laughs> Any volunteers from the back? What do you think we need to bring in to the Newton solver? If this were your exam problem, what does your Newton algorithm need to function? Initial gas, right? I need initial gas. What else? Maybe the residual function, right? What else? The what? Yeah, the tolerance, OK. OK, so we got x0, r of x, the tolerance. What else? Yeah? The derivative, yes. It's that first line up there, guys. You need at least for your routine to work, you need x0, r of x, r prime of x, and a tolerance, right? That's the formula. To be able to compute x1, you need x0, r of x, r of x, and r prime of x, and also a tolerance so that you know where to stop. What would you want it to return? The root, <laughs> clearly, right? Definitely the root. I probably also wanted to return how many iterations that k counter, how many iterations we had to do to find the root, right? Yes, so that's the technical. So let's pull up our Jupyter notebooks and see if we can get that done together. So what are we going to call this routine? Let's call it um, Newton. So def. I have a question about the tolerance. So this is like an this is an approximation, right? It's a method of approximation. If we don't know the actual value of the root, how are we going to know what the tolerance is? We'll, we'll get there. It's not, we're not taking the error between the true root and the approximate root. We're finding a surrogate for that. And that's by evaluating f of the root. 
If that f of the root is close to zero, then it's a root, right? If f of that gas is close enough to zero, or that tolerance, then we know we're good, right? So we do know, yeah, it's not a direct error, it's a surrogate for the error, okay? So let's call it mutant for lack of imagination. And we need our residual function, let's call it f, the derivative, df, x0, and a tolerance, okay? All right. So I'm going to start. Um, so one of your colleagues suggested we do a while loop, right? That makes sense because we're just going to keep looping until we hit that error tolerance. Instead of having to do a for loop, you have to specify the number of iterations. What if you need more than 50 iterations? What if, you know, what if you need 1,000 iterations? Just put a while loop. Makes life easier, OK? So we want while error is greater than tolerance, OK? Then let's, we'll do our thing. So, but first, we need to start our error with some initial value. We start by saying error equal 1,000, for example. So that we make sure that we go into the loop. But then you might say, Professor Saad, what if our tolerance is 1 million? Right? Because the function is huge. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do my error equal tolerance plus 1,000. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> OK. All right. I'm going to implement Newton's method. Newton's method says x1 equal x0 minus f of x0 over df of x0. Now, what is f and df? They are other Python routines that take an argument x and return a value. So we would have, in this case, to implement the residual function. We also have to implement the derivative. OK? We have to implement the derivative. Now, I will say my error is equal absolute value of f of x0, of f, uh, sorry, f of x1. Agreed? So now we computed a new guess for the root. Let's check if that guess is actually a root by evaluating f of x1. OK? Now we reset our, we make x0, our new x0 equal to x1. OK? And then that's it. Return x1. And I also want to return the error. I want to return the value of the error. Right? Yes? We can add a counter. Do you want a counter? OK. Ethan wants a counter. Let's add a counter. OK? N iteration. Number of iterations, e we start equal to zero. And then over here, we're going to in in increment it, n iter plus equal one, and return n iter. How do you like that? Satisfied. You're satisfied. We aim to please. <laughs> yes, Miles. So for the while loop to run, error seems bigger than tolerance. Uh -huh. First error just seems to be bigger than tolerance, but recalculate error anyway. Could you just do error equals tolerance plus one or sure. any? Sure, sure, anything. In fact, you could start by saying your, your initial error is f of x0, right? So your initial error is technically f of x0. Brandon. Um, so I might be missing something. Yes. You said something along the lines. I might not have misunderstood it. Where are we getting so we have an f of x0 plus 1 equals 1 over tolerance? Mm -hmm. And then f of x1 equals 1 over tolerance? Mm -hmm. Where are we getting f of x0 and then f of x1? Where are these f functions? Yes, so we haven't defined them yet. Okay. Like we did with f solve, in this case, pipe residual is our function. Right? As long as this is a callable function, a callable routine, this will work. Right? If you can call f in Python, then this is going to work. We haven't defined df for this problem yet. So we're going to go ahead and define it. With f solve, we didn't have to worry about the derivative. OK? We're going to talk, we're going to have a discussion about that um, in a minute. We're going to have a discussion with Python about that. OK. That's it for Newton. Now, we have everything for this problem, if you remember. So let's go, um, I'm going to hide this for a minute. OK, so our f function, in this case, our residual function, is the pipe residual, but we need a derivative. OK, so we need to define the residual. If we were to solve this, um, 
what is it? Uh, okay. So now the question is, we're going to repeat the, um, the pipe problem, but we're going to do it with our own subroutine and compare it to F-solve, okay? To show you that our routine is exactly what F-solve is doing. However, our routine needs a derivative. Now this is where it gets tricky, why I wanted you to do residual function of H, because that derivative needs to be needs to be defined with respect to the variable in question, the variable of interest. We are solving this equation for h, so we need to differentiate it with respect to h. This is the derivative for this residual function. And on purpose, I picked a complex, complicated derivative like this because that's not something that we want to have to deal with every time. Okay, so let's go ahead and implement this derivative, that's what we're missing now here. We already have the pipe residual. Okay, and then define, gonna call it um, residual df. Okay, and I'm gonna go back to, no long, to not taking arguments. Okay, my, pi, my Newton routine doesn't take arguments. So go ahead and uncomment v, l, and r. Go back to this initial definition of the residual. So just remove the arguments. Now let's define our residual derivative. Okay, if I can find it. <laughs> One second. It's like. Okay. Wow, this is like one annoying derivative, okay? And on purpose, I want you to deal with an annoying derivative because, okay. Let me see how I can do this, okay. All right, so let's define the derivative. It's gonna be minus, so return, let's, let's first define it as minus L times, we open parentheses, it's going to be huge parentheses, we have an R over, well, okay, if you notice, we have H times H minus 2R everywhere, so I'm going to call that some number A, okay, so to simplify the algebra, I'm going to call this A, which is H times H minus 2R. Agreed? So now I have r over mp dot square root of minus a over r squared. Okay, so over r over r, that's over r squared. Okay. Minus h minus r times h minus r, so h minus r squared, over mp dot square root of minus h times a, agreed? Because a is h times h minus 2r. So we have a over minus a over r squared and minus h times a, and over here we're gonna have plus mp dot square root minus h times a. And I need to close the parentheses. Okay, take a moment to copy that. It needs to be painful, this derivative. Putting in this derivative needs to be painful on purpose. <laughs> because I want to come up with a method where we don't have to input a derivative. Because with F solve, we didn't put a derivative. Yes, Mike. So if this is the same system that F solve uses, what situation would we use this instead of F solve? You'll always use F solve. I'm showing you here how to think as an engineer, right? Uh -huh. What's happening behind the scenes? Because now you'll understand if F solve like returned to you some tolerance, oh, it's returning this value, right? That's kind of what happens inside the guts of it, Connor. Give me five minutes, okay? Go, if you want, go ahead and do that in your notebook, okay? And show that you get the same result.
I will, I will follow up on that, Connor, in a minute. Okay? He's just traveling back in time to explain to us what's going to happen next. Okay, so return, sorry. So I'm going to return this value. Return this value, okay? Whoops. Again, I committed an error. I'm glad I'm committing these errors. Uh, what the heck happened here? Oh, I always have this missing parenthesis. Okay. Right? Okay. No error. All right, so now let's go ahead and call our, Python, our Newton method. Okay, do you have the confidence to call the Newton method? No, you don't have the confidence to do it. Let's do it together. Yes? You did make an error in your service. Did I make an error? Where? Like in your service, did you type by the definition of A? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Well, that's why we have. OK, so, so you're right. Yeah. So H, I'm, yep, that's correct. Just negative A over here. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm, I made this on purpose, uh, Nicola. <laughs> Just to show that this approach is prone to human error, OK? Um, this is wonderful. This is better than I had anticipated. OK. So now if we go back to our, OK, so let's, let's make sure we are in sync. We have our residual function. We have V, L, and R defined here globally, OK? And our residual is this guy. Then F solve. Um, uh, hold on. Kernel restart. OK, F solve gave us 1.5. Let's see our Newton method, what it's going to give us. We're going to give it pipe residual as our residual function. We're going to give it residual df as our derivative of the residual function. With respect to H, we're going to give it the same initial guess, 1.0, and we're going to give it a tolerance of 1e to the minus 8. Okay? Look at that. Awesome. Look at this. 1.50569813, and then we have more digits here. We converge to an error of 2.8 times 10 to the minus 14 in four iterations.